Pozvanie sa dostáva na rád Petra Marko, ktorá vidím, že je tu priamo. A, a zase, kým budeš stúpať hore schodami, kým si budeš pripravať prezentáciu, nech ja poviem pár slov k tvojmu predstaveniu. A je toho strašne veľa. Petra má 15-ročnú prax v Londýne. Jej práca sa pohybuje na rozhraní verejného priestoru, urbanizmu, výskumu a facilitácie. Čiže ona je tá sama schopná, ktorá je schopná vlastne zľadovať záujmy skupín oslovať rôzne skupiny, prepája sociálne, ekonomické, fyzické aspekty mestskej regenerácie a je spoluautorkou ocinej strategickej vízie Velocity Placemaking, ktorá sa zameriava na obnovu a održateľný rast dedín rurálnych oblastí. A to je aj téma jej prednášky, prezentácie, ktorá nás čaká Velocity ako stratégia rozvoja rurálnych oblastí. Čiže už počujete zo samotného názvu, že budeme hovoriť vlastne o tom, o využití bicyklov, krásne obrázky. Pozerám, že čo ešte o tebe povedať, ale že si zakladujúcou členkou Faculty London School of Architecture, kde si viedla výskumné think tanky, to znie tak veľmi expertne, sústredujúce sa na inovatívne modely bývania radikálnu premenu Londýna na pešie cyklistické mesto. A musím povedať, že si sama aktívna cyklistka a vedieš tomu aj svoje dieťa. Dúfam, že sa nemýlim. OK, a máš slovo, nech sa páči. No, ďakujem, Sora. Um, so I'm going to do this uh, presentation in English because I've got lots of um, terminology which, which is from urban design placemaking, which I'm struggling with in, in Slovak. So uh, apologies for uh, the non-native um, speakers, but I think there's a really good uh, translation taking place for those who need it. So um, put your headphones on. Uh, so um, my name is Petra Marko. I'm a co-founder of Marko and Placemakers. Um, Okay, um, so uh, we're based in London, but recently we, we also opened um, a branch in Bratislava because we have a growing portfolio of work in a central European region. So this was as a result of uh, various forces, including Brexit and COVID, as you can imagine. Um, our work uh, is quite wide ranging, but actually it's uh, all holding together with the threat of connecting people, place and process. Uh, so. Um, It includes stakeholder engagement, uh, consultation, urban design itself, um, so realized projects. We also do lots of local economy studies and town center studies. Um, we have a growing sector of work in master planning where we, do, where we focus on public space strategy. Um, uh, this, the, the, the example here is from a, a Florence project in Prague, which we won uh, last year at the 24 hectare site. Uh, but also uh, projects to do with uh, high streets regeneration. Uh, and I mentioned that all of this work uh, is thread together uh, with the idea that actually we need to understand the place that we work with, we understand the people and we need to get uh, their feedback, but we need to also bring them into the process of co-creating and understanding um, the possibilities and what you can have, because it's not just about asking people what would you like, but it's also showing Uh, the options and possibilities. And before I go into the topic of the more rural um, strategy uh, velocity, uh, I'd like to actually put a little bit of context uh, of my personal relationship to cycling. So I've been a commuter cyclist in London for the last eight years. I've lived in London for 15 years. So it has taken me seven years to get on the bike in London and to cycle in the context which you see is actually not as friendly as uh, in the Netherlands or in Copenhagen or in, in some of the you know, cycling uh, metropolises. Uh, so um, there are cycle paths in London and there have been more and more cyclists uh, in Lang London over the years. Uh, this, uh, this kind of togetherness or this community and being part of uh, a crowd of cyclists actually makes, makes it uh, safer and makes, makes you more confident to join in. So yesterday when we were cycling as a group, this was also a wonderful feeling because uh, you are part of the group, you actually uh, are more noticeable to the cars. Uh, but actually the situations in London that I uh, sometimes encountered uh, as on the right hand side are, are quite extreme. Uh, nevertheless, I feel more um, confident and more safe to cycle around London than to cycle around Bratislava, which, which in itself is, is, is a kind of uh, interesting phenomenon that, I, that I'm now looking at as, as, as I'm more in spending more time in Bratislava now. Uh, so in London, with the arrival of, of our son, um, 
it has taken a while, but we have also uh, took him on board with the cycling. And then early on, um, as he started to cycle by himself, introducing uh, this practice, that the freedom of, of being independent and being able to move around. And um, over the last few years, I have to say that the cycling infrastructure in London has improved massively. I'm talking about this example because uh, lots of people in Bratislava and other cities around in Slovakia say, you know, it is not possible here because of this or that. And then I would like to talk about London because it's a nine million people city, which is a very intense uh, and very tense city. Uh, but actually there are specific steps, uh, structural steps that the city can put in place. And if there is a vision to actually make that step change and that transformation. Uh, here is uh, just a couple of examples. In 2016, uh, the mayor of London, uh, Sadi Khan, has appointed a full-time cycling commissioner. This is somebody who really uh, takes forward uh, the goals and the targets and the strategies for cycling. So one of the goals is that by 2041, 80% of the journeys are to be made by walking, cycling and public transport in London. That's a very ambitious target and it's important to have ambitious targets. And we have seen yesterday on the wonderful tour around uh, Trnava with the mayor and with the chief architect that actually this is uh, um, a leadership, uh, a collective leadership uh, which is setting very ambitious targets and is looking as, at the best practice examples around the world. So, so I really uh, commend that. Um, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, UK has also signed over 2 billion funding for cycling and walking. This is nationwide, but not just London. Um, and uh, change is possible. Uh, so let's have a look at some lovely examples of uh, implementing change and actually measuring change. We've heard something about data in the previous presentation. For me, this is a very powerful data in the middle that you can see the change uh, which was uh, achieved by introducing uh, the so-called ultra-low emissions zone. So you cannot enter central London zone uh, with a certain type of uh, motor vehicle, with certain type of engine, and, and uh, this has actually improved the air quality massively. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's also uh, there's lots of initiatives. One that I can mention is Hackney School Streets, which started as an initiative of five schools taking part, which has been scaled up to 40 schools over two years, uh, led by uh, the local authority as well. Um, and during the pandemic, 100 kilometers of temporary segregated cycle paths were implemented. This was twice the speed that cycle paths were being implemented prior to the pandemic. So the crisis is an opportunity and we all can be part of that change. So uh, what I'd like to say is that actually uh, we are here amongst professionals and people from the industry who already believe that cycling is great and uh, that pla you know places should be for people and so on and so forth. We believe that there is a climate emergency. Uh, there are other people who uh, completely don't believe it. And then there are people in the gray zone in the middle who would like to change something about their daily routine, but they're finding it difficult uh, to make that step on their own. And I think these are people that we, each of us has in our own community of friends, of colleagues, and that we can um, we can lead by example and we can uh, even sometimes by discussing difficult uh, issues or personal uh, traumas or problems that we've had experienced. In my case, uh, our son has asthma, so we've uh, experienced a series of uh, hospitalizations related to this. And it is something that I had started to talk about only a few years later, because uh, as a parent, you default immediately when something is happening to your child to thinking, w what am I doing wrong? Is, is it my fault? Uh, that this is happening to him. But actually, you, you realize that there are so many environmental factors and uh, the, uh, the sort of society that we live in. And actually, you can turn it into this opportunity to talk about it. You know, why is it important that we cycle? Actually, is also because if you look at statistics about air quality around primary schools, which in Bratislava and other cities would be really useful to have, then maybe more parents would actually start listening why uh, cycling is something that's, that's important. Um, I've introduced a couple of children uh, already to uh, the tram system in Bratislava who had lived there for 
for a few years and they had never ridden the tram. So, you know, I'm <laughs> it's, it's really simple, simple stuff. So um, I'm going to uh, now jump into the topic of the countryside. So we all talk a lot about cities and it's important and cities, I believe, are still the most sustainable uh, places for people to live. And uh, But not everybody lives in cities and not everybody has or should live in cities. And uh, there's a lot happening in the countryside, the degrading biodiversity, uh, unsustainable practices, people, uh, people dependent on cars. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Velocity, which is a project that started um, as a competition that we won in 2017. It was a National Infrastructure Commission um, competition for Oxford-Cambridge Corridor, and the six of us um, who met through cycling as friends and never actually collaborated professionally together, came together an inter interdisciplinary team of architects, engineers, and, and planners. And, um, uh, and we thought, you know, everybody's talking about cities and in the Oxford-Cambridge corridor, there's one million new homes coming by 2050. Where are these homes going to be built? Yes, of course, in, in the major cities, Oxford, Cambridge, Milton Keynes, but also uh, there is a huge potential and opportunity to actually start to look at this difficult problem of what's happening in the countryside. You've got increasing congestion, aging population, people are being priced out, the properties in, in English countryside are actually quite expensive. Uh, it, is, uh, it is, I think, uh, the other way around uh, over here. Um, and and uh, there's unhealthy uh, dependency on cars as the services have been eroded uh, over the years. So uh, what is happening uh, and what is happening also uh, in rural areas uh, here in Slovakia is, is that we've got this, uh, this sprawl, these sprawling villages, sprawling suburban towns where, uh, build, uh, where houses are built along roads uh, with, with parking and uh, no connection uh, to the locality. Uh, but there is another way which, which is uh, about compact villages and interconnected villages. Rural areas make up 85% of UK's uh, land uh, and 18% of population live, live there, so it is a significant portion of people. And there are, there are over 10,000 villages uh, in England only. So the key principles that we developed with, with the velocity principle were, were people over cars, uh, that's self-explanatory, uh, compact, as I mentioned, we don't want uh, housing to sprawl and people to be far away from the services and dependent on cars. Uh, but it is importantly also in rural areas and, and the interconnectivity we've been uh, hearing about in the previous talk, it's important that actually uh, the, the, the villages can, uh, uh, can support one another uh, through this interconnected network and, and having different services that each of them can offer. So connected, not isolated. It is also about unlocking land, and Trenava is, um, is doing this very smartly, as we've heard, unlocking land for new development and then actually being able to finance other uh, projects and services for, for the city. So it's about places to live and work. So there are actually lots of um, startups, lots of micro-businesses based in the countryside um, which can be supported uh, and it is about a resilient uh, landscape, so uh, pr pr promoting sustainable environments, health and well-being. Uh, I mentioned Oxford-Cambridge Corridor, here you can see it in the context of London. Oxford-Cambridge Corridor is the fastest growing innovation uh, corridor in the UK. Uh, a very dynamic uh, and, 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 and very uh, profitable place uh, to, to base yourself if, if you are uh, in business or innovation or a student. Uh, so we looked at uh, uh, the, the future planned railway connection between Oxford uh, and Cambridge and we looked at the clusters of villages around towns and how we could connect um, how we could connect them to the nearest railway station, uh, but also how we can connect uh, villages uh, to one another, take, take cars to the edges, and start to crisscross between the villages using the bridleways and pathways across the fields uh, to connect uh, the villages on a daily basis on your journey to school or to work. And, uh, or you could then go uh, into the nearest station and, and, and travel to the city where, where you need to. Uh, we've seen a change of working patterns during the pandemic, so lots of people are working uh, from home some days uh, and then commuting to work other days. So, so making that home environment in the rural areas, you know, more inclusive and more um, walkable, that's, that's also really important. Uh, the resource that we see in the countryside is the actual countryside, is the landscape. Uh, in many parts it is degraded, but actually it's about safeguarding um, 
and uh, enhancing uh, the biodiversity that we, that we already have, but also using the landscape actively for recreation uh, and drawing people in uh, as, as a community anchor. Uh, and uh, across the corridor, uh, in these clusters of villages, you can imagine that each uh, cluster could have a different focus, so it could become a destination also for visitors. Uh, so we're talking about tourism or sort of agricultural tourism. Um, and, and within the cluster, so, so there's a sort of sharing economy um, going across all the scales. So in the cluster, you could have one uh, village that can provide a local surgery or a medical service. Uh, another village can have a weekly market, and they all support each other. Um, the same way, uh, actually, all the way down to a new housing field where you can have um, an eating barn or a cycle workshop, where you can have those communal facilities for the new inhabitants. So we actually tr um, cycled around and, and, and trialed uh, the distances, and, and it is all very cyclable. So, so the previous slide was actually... Um, so, uh, so, so the study cluster that we looked at, uh, you can see the distances are very... Um, very cyclable, so, so for a child or an elderly person, we're not talking about cycling in Lycra for two hours or four hours, we're talking about really short cycling distances. We talked to the locals and uh, some of the local businesses, what they appreciate about the countryside. And we came up with um, some simple design codes uh, and, and, uh, and a plan where the pink fields you can see are um, suggestions of how you can build tightly around uh, uh, the historic village core, so you allocate the housing very near. Uh, what's happening a lot in, in the UK countryside is that you would have uh, a new village which is far removed uh, from any existing infrastructure, so you have to build new infrastructure, you have to get there, you have two different communities, the new one, the old one, there's no interaction or no connection between them. Um, so this is all about uh, making villages compact and walkable. It is also about, about <laughs> preserving the views into the, uh, into the countryside. Um, and we looked at uh, specific typologies uh, that draw, uh, take clues from, from the existing rural typologies. And this includes uh, uh, the shed, because in the countryside we don't just have the picturesque uh, nice uh, houses with pitched roofs, but we also have uh, the agricultural, industrial buildings. And some of those uh, can be repurposed and some of those can, can serve uh, for different use as, as we transform the way we live. And, uh, we sort of visualize this for the purpose of the competition, this idea of, of, uh, of the compact village with the gray buildings being the existing, and then the other different typologies and getting the deliveries uh, to the edge of the village so you can create a car-free walkable um, village environment and then connecting the map. So uh, you could say, that's nice, but so what? You know, this was an ideas competition. Um, we, we got a little bit of prize money, most of which we spent on, on, on actually doing it. And, uh, but we, we kept on uh, pushing forward. And, and since we won the competition, we've, um, we've launched our manifesto at Oslo Architecture Triennale in 2019, where uh, we sort of published our principles. We have uh, received funding from William Sut from Clarion Group, uh, which is a housing group in London, uh, by winning the William Sutton Prize for um, placemaking and social housing. And uh, we've, we've sort of developed partnerships with uh, people like Brompton and visited places uh, to look at best practice examples. Um, so this is some of the field research that we've done and also met with Gala Architects um, and understanding what's some of the interesting things that are already there. So uh, a dent uh, in Cambria is a village which is very dense, uh, but is also perceived as picturesque. And there are some simple things that you can do. For example, this grass creed, which which creates, which makes the car parking on the edge of the village blend into the landscape. Uh, we looked at, you know, the example of the potato row houses, the famous potato row houses in Copenhagen, and how that has inspired uh, some new housing typologies, car-free housing typologies. And we were commissioned by Blenheim Estate, who own Blenheim Palace and a series of villages in Oxfordshire, uh, to develop a strategy for them, and then also make a submission for Oxfordshire Plan 2050. So this is an ongoing, uh, ongoing project, helping uh, Blenheim Estate to become the UK's first car and negative land managers. We looked at the different routes across uh, the estate. We were able to open up uh, the park and then uh, uh, do some trial uh, cycle to school last summer. 
And last uh, couple of minutes, <laughs> I'm going to dedicate to Ben Lakva, which was uh, initially headlined on on the program. So uh, we won a competition for the strategic vision for Ben Lakva at the end of last year. Ben Lakva is a uh, is a village of 8,000 people officially, but but actually about 12,000 people, which is expected to grow to 20,000 people. So the administ local administration is is one of the first in in this region to actually commission a strategic vision uh, to stop the sprawl. This is a very typical style of uh, suburban uh, development in uh, the outskirts of Bratislava that you can see. Uh, Benelakova is 17 kilometers from Bratislava, so. Uh, so it is a commuter village, but at the same time, it's got history, and uh, we have looked at it um, with the sort of velocity goggles on, and we've we actually recognize that uh, it is part of a cluster of villages around the riparian forest. So this is a very um, important natural habitat uh, that that the cluster of villages can can draw on. Uh, so so looking from that big level, we actually uh, came up with an approach. Of, of the high-level strategy uh, and, the, uh, and the detail, you know, how does it look like uh, from an eye-level perspective and some high-level principles uh, of what we want the vision to, to deliver. I don't think I have a lot of time to go into a lot of detail, but uh, basically we're looking at uh, the landscape which is going to limit the growth uh, and give some, some framework to the growth, like, you know, uh, so, so that we, we stop the sprawl. At the same time, we are densifying, we're building new housing. Uh, we are talking about in, uh, intensifying and improving the railway. Um, infrastructure and uh, the stations uh, and connectivity by bicycle from the station uh, so so you know the multimodal that many people talks about uh, bicycle train and then bicycle or walking uh, and we're talking about uh, the life itself sort of like distributed centers and strengthening of the existing centers so this was the the final master plan which is now uh, going to be uh, developed uh, as, as a commission uh, from the local authority and and uh, the end game is that it will be in, um, incorporated into the local plan for the village, which is going to turn into a town. Effectively, uh, you can see that uh, there's, a, there's a kind of compact allocation of where the new housing is going to be. Um, we talked about the park and ride uh, cycle paths, and uh, we've asked Ciclo Quality also to consult with us on, on the strategy for cycling and interconnecting. Um, it is also about creating those small moments uh, uh, locally, not just the big uh, plazas and squares, and looking at quick wins, how that landscape can be transformed, uh, how the housing typology is, is moving from the typical development where 40% is taken up by roads into something that you can see on the right-hand side um, diagram. And uh, then going into more detail of the different housing typologies, which uh, are a combination of uh, densifying existing housing, uh, then building new housing on the edges towards the big back garden, and then actually uh, having also those family houses. So all of this is available online uh, for those who are interested to, to look at the project in more detail. I'm aware of the time, so I'm just going to show you uh, some of the moves that we then also looked at how would this look like, you know, simple ways of changing uh, things and transforming uh, key moments um, in the village uh, turned town. And, and that's all for me. Thank you very much. And sorry for going over. A áno, ja teraz len pomenujem niektoré veci, sme v časovom skloze, my to vieme. Hej, a ja som sa ostýchala prerušiť takú skvelú prezentáciu, v podstate každá prezentácia je skvelá. Ja teraz presmerujem tie otázky, ktoré by boli v tomto momente na Petru do tej kávovej prestávky. Toto je Petra Marko, viete teraz už, čo všetko dokáže a čo dokázala, takže si ju odchyte, konzultujte, ale jednu otázku na teba mám a skús krátku odpoveď. A aké je to vlastne osloviť a pracovať so, so samozprávou malej slovenskej obce alebo sídla, keď človek prináša komplexný a vizionársky prístup? Uh, tak musím povedať, že, že v prípade Bernolákova zatiaľ sme teda prišli do toho štádia, že sme vyhrali súťaž, ale mali sme niekoľko stretnutí a 
teraz je plánované stretnutie vlastne na tú ďalšiu fázu. Musím povedať, že uh, som bola veľmi, veľmi pozitívne prekvapená uh, vlastne touto iniciatívou. V tomto prípade naozaj ten client leadership prichádza, musí prísť z hora, pretože vlastne vôbec by tento brief nebol, táto súťaž by nebola, keby obec nemala záujem. A čo bolo vyzdvihnuté v uh, tej súťaži o našom návrhu, bol práve ten komplexný prístup uh, vo, vo všetkých rovinách. Takže vlastne nefokusujeme sa len, ako teraz budú vyzerať tie domčeky, uh, alebo ak, uh, ako to bude jedno námestie, ale v podstate snažíme sa uchopiť uh, ten rozvoj uh, z hora a, a takisto až, až do posledného detailu. Takže uh, teším sa na, na ďalšiu spoluprácu a akurát včera mi písali, že uh, v júni máme, máme stretnutie ako takých kick na tú ďalšiu fázu. Super, veľká vďaka ešte raz. Ďakujem pekne.